My plane doesn't leave for another hour, but what, me worry? I have a laptop portable with me. 640K, two disk drives, lots of powerful software. I can get an hour's worth of work done while I'm waiting. Indeed, laptop portables are finally making a dent in the PC marketplace this year. Today, we're going to take a look at the new generation of laptop portables on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible modems. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Leading Edge, leading the way to the information age. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, this is the work slate from Convergent Technologies. It came out just about four years ago, yet it's already an antique, a collector's item. It's the old remnant of what laptops used to be, basically small display, hard to read display, and so on. Laptops just didn't make it for a while. All of a sudden, they're the hottest thing. Everybody's trying to buy them. In fact, you can't even get them in some places. What has changed all of a sudden to make laptop portables so big? Well, sir, I think one of the key is, is uh, the fact that we have full functionality now in portables. We get real uh, spoiled in our office using an AT-style mm -hmm. machine, nice keyboard, nice display. Nowadays, you can buy a portable. It has a good readable display. You buy it with a hard disk system, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And you can really use that unusable time, like in the airplane, the typical application. <laughs> okay, we're going to have kind of the battle of the laptop portables today. We'll see the newest machines from Tandy, NEC, Toshiba, Zenith, Grid, HP, and something called the Dynamac. First of all, let's take a look at what people actually do with these laptop portables. Taking a computer on the road is not for everyone. But many business travelers are discovering the practical side to carrying a portable machine. Joe Dennison travels through Central California for the Chevron Company, selling fertilizer chemicals. He's been carrying his Hewlett Packard portable for over two years. At his hotel, he can prepare sales reports and keep track of his appointments. Through a modem connection, he can get account information from the office mainframe. Joe spends several days at a time in rural areas, but his office travels with him as long as he can find an outlet and a telephone. Joe takes his computer to his clients as well. It's no more cumbersome than a case full of binders, and it holds a lot more information. Joe's HP Portable comes with software built into a ROM chip, but he usually carries along a disk drive and a printer for the inevitable hard copy. If he's unable to answer a question, he can call up the company's database and retrieve up-to-the-minute pricing and stock information. One of the most common problems faced by business travelers is communicating with other co-workers who may themselves be on the road or simply hard to reach. The solution is electronic mail, a common mailbox where Joe can transmit and receive messages whenever it's convenient. Portable computers have yet to achieve the popularity originally predicted by industry analysts. But with legible screens, lighter weight, and some serious software, portables are becoming genuine alternatives. Joining us now in the studio is Bob Wade, Bob's regional marketing manager for Tandy, and next to Bob is Jim Bartlett, computer products marketing manager for NEC. Gary? Bob, I understand Tandy has sold about a quarter million of these machines over the last six years, so you probably have a pretty good idea what your customer profile is. <laughs> the largest user of the Tandy laptop is the journalism profession. Virtually all major newspapers in the United States and around the world have uh, used the Model 102 for remote data uh, transmittal back to the home office for publication. Oh, is that how it was originally conceived? or is it a... The original thought on the Model 102, or the Model 100 as it was six years ago, was to be able to build a machine that would be able to be a remote terminal mm -hmm. to retrieve data in the field and then transmit data back to the home office 
uh, for salespeople, business professionals. Mm -hmm. Bob, one of the great features of the Model 100, of course, is very light, very portable, and so on. I've, I've always imagined the ultimate portability, matching that thing with a cellular phone. In fact, you guys do that now, don't you? Yes, we do. We uh, offer a connection from our Model 102 into our new product line, the cellular telephone, which will allow uh, remote data transmittal. The police departments uh, throughout the United States are now experimenting with that project to allow the officer to transmit through the cellular telephone directly into their database at the uh, police station. Mm -hmm. Now, Jim, uh, in the early days, one thought about NEC as having a kind of product similar to the 100. You've got another direction you've gone in now with the multi-speed. Tell us about that computer. Okay, Stu. Well, this, um, this machine <clears throat> is a uh, MS-DOS uh, machine. Uh, it's PC compatible. And uh, we developed this uh, based on market research that showed us uh, that what people wanted uh, uh, in the business world anyway, was a, uh, an expansion uh, to add to their desktop machine, a desktop supplement really. And uh, we see a transition in, in the near future from desktops to uh, portable type machines that can provide a no compromise solution, essentially all the performance of a desktop in a machine that uh, people can take on the road with them. Jim, give us a little, little guided tour of that piece of hardware there. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, the screen is a Super Twist LCD technology screen, which is uh, the highest readability uh, technology mm -hmm. existing in LCD right now. Uh, and it's detachable, which allows you to easily uh, use a color monitor uh, behind the machine. So you've got an RGB off. output on there? Correct. We have a full-size keyboard in the front here with a separate numerical keypad and function keys that are placed similarly to what people are used to having. Um, on this side, you can see the optional 300-1200 baud uh, Hayes compatible modem. On the uh, back, there's a serial port, uh, parallel port, RGB video port, external uh, uh, disk drive controller port, uh, and the control configuration switches and so forth on the back. Now, Jim, there's a, the one thing that seems to be missing that's different from the a, a desktop is, say, a hard disk uh, as a part of this. And right. And, uh, you know, for, for example, the, for my requirements, it would be really nice to have a 10 or 20 megabyte hard disk. Are you I think considering doing that? Or? <laughs> I think we'd all like to have a 20 okay. megabyte hard disk. Uh, we do have uh, two uh, three, uh, 720K uh, mm -hmm. disk drives, floppy disk drives. And uh, although we uh, really uh, thought hard about putting, a, say, a 20 megabyte hard disk in this, our market research indicated that there was a large market subsegment that required portability and some degree of battery life, let's say four to six hours. And we could do that with the performance of this machine. It's running at 90 9.54 mm -hmm. megahertz with a very fast processor, a 16-bit processor. And uh, we could do that along with a modem and all the other features uh, and the built-in software that this machine has. But if you add a hard disk, then you almost have to be uh, six feet from an AC outlet mm -hmm. and plugged see, in yeah. all the time. Jim, let, let me ask you about the software. Like the Model 100, of course, software and ROM basically is what mm -hmm. you carry around. Now, you've got ROM software in here, plus mm -hmm. you've got the disk drives. What what? How's that work? I mean, should, should I be using ROM software? Should I be carrying around my software and loading it in the floppies or what? Well, that's a good question, actually. And uh, since you mentioned it, here's the ROM-based uh, software. Uh, we have 512K of uh, software built into ROM. It includes a notepad, uh, filer, dialer, uh, a number of uh, productivity tools. But if and, I want to uh, use traditional software, I mean Lotus or a popular word you processor, can do that as well. I buy it on disk or I can buy it on a chip? Well, you can buy it on disk and plug it in the machine. I, actually, the, the biggest reason for for these uh, sockets in addition to the stuff we've put in is we've allowed two sockets for the VAR uh -huh. who wants to uh, use special uh -huh. application software that he develops, installs in the machine, and he can sell it as a turnkey solution. What, what's the price range on this? What's the cost to buy a multi-speed? Suggested retail price is nineteen ninety-five. And last question, what about the multi-speed? What's the point in having the two speeds on the machine? Very good question. Uh, Everyone uh, is used to the 4.77 right. clock speed, and some software works fine, and there's not really any reason to go faster. But a lot of most, uh, a lot of applications, especially today, spreadsheets and so forth, can take advantage of the higher uh, processing speed. But uh, if a program doesn't require that, running it at the slower speed saves uh, on battery. I see. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. In just a minute, we'll take a look at the Toshiba T1100 and the Zenith Z181. So stay with us. With us now in the studio is Andrew Chernick, Marketing Director for Zenith, and sitting next to Andy is Tom Sherrard, PC Product Marketing Manager with Toshiba. Gary? Andy, uh, an early criticism of the portables was the uh, display. Uh, very difficult to read, especially in the 
lighting, uh, support lighting like airplanes, for example. <laughs> it makes it almost unusable. Uh, what's happened with display technology? Well, uh, you're exactly right. We did some early research with machines and would show them to people, and they'd say, is the display on? Uh, two <laughs> things have happened to uh, displays. One of our engineers realized a few years ago that while an LCD may not be acceptable, you could put a light behind the LCD and illuminate the screen and uh, still keep it battery operated. And the second thing that's, that's happened is that we've uh, been able to um, go to a screen technology where the LCDs are readable from the side uh, and you don't have mm -hmm. to be directly on the machine. Mm -hmm. Now that Super Twist you're talking about, yes, we've heard a lot. What exactly is Super Twist? How has that changed LCD? Super Twist is simply a, a technology that twists the crystals far enough that you can, you can see them from the side and instead of having to be uh, directly within 10 degrees of center to see the screen. So you think the backlighting is a very important part of that? Uh, we, believe, then. we believe it's mandatory for the products. Now, what about uh, just uh, the fact that the display technology is moving along also? Uh, your CGA, which is sort of the old technology, is that what we're using for the portables now, CGA? Yes, we're using CGA, but mm -hmm. uh, liquid crystal displays display information differently. They display it in blocks on the screen, Gary, mm -hmm. so that you don't have the problem with uh, spots appearing on the screen that you do with uh, high-resolution monitors. Mm -hmm. Andy, the Z181 is a pretty hot laptop portable now, and the screen, of course, is what a lot of people are, are commenting about. Give us a little quick tour of, of the 181. Okay. As you can see, Stuart, uh, the machine uh, has the cover that folds down and completely covers the, uh, the keyboard. It has an illuminated screen, and it's a full-size screen, just like a, a CRT. Uh, the disk drives pop up in the front. Um, on the side, you have the ability to add a modem. Um, and the modem also connects a telephone handset. On the back, you have your serial port, your parallel port, your video connector, and an external floppy disk uh, drive adapter as well. And it comes with 640K of uh, memory at the same time. And what's the price range on the 181? Uh, it's suggested retail is $2399 with MS DOS. And okay, Tom, you're configured. in the same range now, and another hot one is the T1100. And, and tell us what's distinctive, what's new about the T1100 Plus, I guess is fact what you the call The T1100 Plus, right. The, uh, we think the most important thing in a portable is, is portability, and, and that translates when you're carrying it around and you're using it in, in cramped quarters like an airplane to size and weight. So we've got a machine that is just under 10 pounds and about a foot square. Um, so it's reasonable to carry. Any, anything's too heavy, but this is, this is better than 15 or 20 pounds. Um, it, uh, What's your approach for, to the screen, Tom? It's a super twist LCD. <laughs> it's not backlit. It's a reflective technology, which... Uh, which means that uh, in bright light, you've got real good visibility. Of course, if it's really dim, you, you do have a problem seeing it, and that's where backlighting becomes an advantage. Um, we have a full-size standard what's keyboard. What's the, the, the battery life uh, consequence of not having? The battery life runs about eight hours. Um, if you use the discs heavily, it goes down from that. If you use the modem a lot, it goes down from that. But uh, it can easily run on uh, a cross-country telephone, uh, cross-country airplane <laughs> flight, or you can use it all day in a typical working day. Now, uh, in, in both of these cases, you have micro floppies of three and a half inch drives, which become the standard now, but it's still a pain in the neck, frankly, to get your software. You can't buy very much software on, on three and a half inch drives. Uh, is that a problem for the user, or do you see these things eventually replacing five and a quarter inch drives? Absolutely. We think by the end of the year, everything will be in three and a half inch format. And we've risen, we did a check last June, there were about 75 popular packages available in three and a half, so now it's about 250 packages. So eventually you'll see three and a half uh, replace five and a quarters. They're smaller, they consume less power, they're less expensive, and they uh, give us a lot more design flexibility in putting together lightweight machines like this. Well, Andy, what about uh, the comment that people say, well, these, these may replace uh, the uh, desktop machines at some point. Um, is that going to happen, do you think? I'm a little more skepti skeptical because desktop machines uh, are much more flexible. They give you expansion slots in the first place, and all of us put different types of expansion in the machine. The video is, uh, is much higher resolution on desktop machines and gives you uh, very good color. In addition, you get the power of 8286, 8386, uh, processors and high speed, high capacity, 20, 40, 80, 120 megabyte Winchesters. So I'm very skeptical that desktops will do it. As fast as portables move up, desktops will move up and probably outpace them. Mm -hmm. One more question. We always hear about battery life, and you've given us the battery life numbers on these machines. I'm interested in recharge time. When that thing's dead at the end of a plane trip, how long does it take me to get these things back up? 
Well, in the case of this machine, it'll recharge in about six hours, and you can be using it during that time. Mm -hmm. So the AC adapter, which is just a typical small recharger block, um, plugs into it. You can then start using the machine immediately, and uh, and it will recharge slowly while it's running and, and more quickly when it's turned off. There are a couple options here. Uh, several of the of the machines have replaceable battery packs mm -hmm. on the so bottom. So you can carry an extra battery pack. That's correct. And you also can uh, purchase now high-speed chargers that will cut that battery charge time from eight six to eight hours down to three to four hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Now, in just a minute, we're going to take a look at the Toshiba T3100, an AT-compatible laptop. We'll also take a look at something called the Dynamac, the very first Macintosh laptop. Now, the grid has been known as a high-end laptop portable for several years, used in lots of exotic different applications, and Wendy Woods has a report on one of them. Whether flying in the sky, at sea, or on the ground, portables are being used to accurately and quickly locate a geographical point on Earth. Trimble Navigation manufactures an Earth station receiver and antenna which gather data from satellites. That data is fed into a portable computer, in this case a grid, equipped with Trimble software, and recorded on floppy disk. The data is accurate up to four feet from anywhere on the globe. The advantage of using a laptop computer is that the surveyor is able to take the data and to process the data right essentially in the field. So he knows before he goes home whether he's taken uh, good data. And that's very important to the surveying community because oftentimes it's very expensive to get a whole crew out to where they might be going. They might have rented a helicopter or a boat or something. So um, they need to know right then and there that they've taken good data. And if they've made a mistake, they can go back and do it again. Trimble is the largest seller of computerized survey equipment. The company has sold over 200 of these $40,000 GPS units, and virtually all their customers use them with grids. Grid reports its portables are in use by more than 50 U.S. government agencies and more than 400 Fortune 1000 companies. And as the portables become lighter and more powerful, like this new grid light, even more innovative applications for them will be found. In Mountain View, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us now in the studio is Britt Blazer, Vice President of Dynamac, and back with us, Tom Sherrard of Toshiba. Stuart, you know, we start out looking at the Tandy 100, and we're, now we're into uh, we, we AC-powered uh, hard yeah, disks yeah. and this so is the major forth. Leagues. Now, uh, what, uh, what really uh, is the appeal of a, of a system like this, where you have, have to have AC power, you don't have the battery pack, you can't go on an airplane, who's buying a machine like this? Just all kinds of people. We're finding uh, people like accountants and auditors, uh, consultants who need to carry their machines to their work, and they've been lugging things like compacts, and they're very tired of it, or they've been, or they've had two machines, one at home and one at work, and carrying diskettes back and forth. And now they can take a machine like this, which gives them almost everything an AT would do, but in a package that's that's really truly portable. Can you describe the 3100? Some of its features. Yeah, it's a uh, an AT compatible machine, 8286 processor. It has a gas plasma display that has 640 by 400 resolution, so it's double the resolution of a typical CGA monitor. Mm -hmm. um, has a 10 megabyte hard disk drive built in, 720K, three and a half inch floppy drive, parallel serial ports, um, and has the ability to go to an expansion chassis for IBM compatible cards in a fixed location. Tom, why did you go to gas plasma display on this particular machine? Well, it has it has a lot of good characteristics. It's it's very very readable. It's extremely sharp. It has the double resolution, 640 by 400, that uh, that gives you a lot of a lot of capability in terms of of high resolution graphics and uh, high resolution for things like desktop publishing. Um, it's also it puts out light so that it's mm -hmm. it's easier to read than any of the passive displays. And you're not worried about battery drain, I guess. Battery's not a problem case. since it, it's plugged in anyway. What about the hard disk? We hear about how fragile hard disks are, and I get nervous about banging around that thing with that hard drive in there. Is is that a problem? Um, not not a serious one. This this drive is engineered specifically for portable applications, so it's intended to take some hard knocks both when it's working and when it's uh, when it's not. It parks the heads when you're not using it, so the heads are off the, the data zone when you're transporting it. So we've had very little problem with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's, that's a pretty hot machine. It's pretty hard to get these things. It's an AT portable for the first time. And I want to turn to you, Britt. You've got something else which is brand new, the first Macintosh portable. And tell us about this Dynamac. Well, the Dynamac uh, takes the same philosophy as the uh, Toshiba 3100. Uh, we do know why people are responding to this. They are responding. It's because of the hard disk internal. We have a 40 megabyte hard drive 
in this machine. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll take 75 G's when it's not operating, take 10 G's when it is operating. Uh, and we also have four megs of main memory and an internal modem. As you can see, it's the same screen as, the, uh, uh, as any of the uh, uh, Macintoshes. Uh, this particular uh, screen I'm running, uh, there's slightly under 10 megabytes of applications here, mm -hmm. and I've got another 30 available. And I just want to demonstrate to you uh, uh, where we are in main memory right now. I've got eight applications loaded at the moment mm -hmm. using 2.9 megabytes, and there's 1.2 megabytes in, available for additional work. Any, any compromises here in making the Mac portable? Have you lost anything in the Macintosh? No. In fact, in every case, we've extended the Macintosh's capabilities. The Macintosh user is very intimate with his machine. And, and because of that intimacy, he wants the machine always available. And, uh, and for that reason, uh, having the hard drive and the capability of accessing it is very important. It's a, an extended feature Macintosh, and one of those features happens to be portability. Now, in the back, it's still operating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In the yeah, back, you'll see we back. have the Macintosh motherboard. Let's bend it around a bit so everybody can see this. Uh -huh. Okay, the Macintosh motherboard is the same as any Macintosh. Mm -hmm. Composite video output, e-machine output, which gives you a 17-inch monitor. Uh, we also have external keypad, external keyboard, uh, modem, 110, 220 volts. Now, I want to ask you the same thing Gary asked Tom. Who's, who's using this? What would be, well, of course, you're just starting to sell it now, but I mean, Correct. who would use it? What do you see as the application for? Again, it doesn't run on batteries. It does not, but it does go on airplanes. We should point that out. Okay. <laughs> so you just can't use it there. <laughs> uh -huh. But who would you see using this? Who's going to buy this as opposed to a Macintosh? The journalist who may not want to record things on site, uh, but edit all his stuff, like downloading from a Tandy 100 or 102. Mm -hmm. um, field workers, uh, your auditors, that's going to be a very large user of this. Um, and, and the fact that you can have 40 megabytes out there, so you've not lost a thing. And of course, going on the desktop, uh, by supporting an external keypad, external keyboard, and an external monitor, this can hang underneath your desk. All your data is always with you. How about desktop publishing? Do you see use of that? In Absolutely. The our production screen, this is a prototype, but our production, uh, as in Tom's machine, will be 640 by 400. We went to the electroluminescence screen. It's a finer pitched. We believe it has better resolution. Mm -hmm. And of course, for the Macintosh graphics, that's required. Yeah. Yeah. What is your uh, feeling, uh, uh, Brent, on the, on the replacement of uh, desktop uh, machines by these portables? I mean, this is much more uh, closely related to existing port uh, exactly, desktops. Exactly uh, uh, what we have in mind. Andy to Siebold told me about a concept called jerk and run, <laughs> uh, which is uh, that you simply can take this machine and go with it right now, but when you're in the office, it'll plug into a large monitor and ex external keyboard. The point is the hard disk is always there and always accessible as long as you can find a cord. We also do offer a battery adapter, so you can run it on battery. Uh -huh. uh, batteries are heavier, yeah. that's all, yeah. and because of the hard drive, there's no room inside the machine or the car yeah. cigarette lighter. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, about 30 seconds left. We've seen a lot of development in the last couple of years in these portables. What's going to happen next? What are we going to see in the next couple of years in laptops? More of the same, I think, basically. More, more disk storage, more speed, more memory, um, lighter weight for the same kind of capabilities. The same, it's, it's really the same kind of development that's happened in desktops. Non-volatile RAM mm -hmm. and battery working at this level of power. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. We hope we've helped you figure out which laptop portable is best for you. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's Computer News. In the random access file this week, lots of rumors about a new Amiga computer, the 2000. The new Amiga reportedly will be capable of running MS-DOS software through an add-on board called the Amiga Bridge. The Amiga 2000 will use the 68000 microprocessor coupled with a 68020 coprocessor operating at 14 megahertz. The basic Amiga 2000 with one floppy and a megabyte of RAM will sell for around $1,500. Commodore is also expected to come out with a low-cost version of the original Amiga priced at around $600. Hewlett Packard is announcing two new versions of its LaserJet printer. The LaserJet 2 will be a smaller, less expensive version of the LaserJet Plus. The new laser printer will sell for under $3,000. HP is also introducing the LaserJet 2000, a high-end machine that can knock out 20 pages a minute. Analysts predict that sales of laser printers will double this year, estimating a $1 billion laser printer market for 1987. The Coast Guard Academy has become the 18th American college to require a freshman to buy a personal computer. The Coast Guard has picked the Macintosh as the official student computer. West Point and Annapolis are also among the schools requiring computers for their incoming students. 
Two American universities now allow students to register via online computer systems. Ricks College in Idaho has joined pioneer BYU in using online registration. Even if you don't have a computer, you can still register online using a touch-tone phone. The computer communicates with the student through a voice synthesizer. Time for a look at software in this week's review from Paul Schindler. This is one way to sell automobiles. This is another. This is an advertisement for Ford Motor Company's Mercury Mercure. It's one of the oddest software reviews we've ever done because this isn't a package you buy, it's one you get for free. The question of whether it does anything useful is in the eye of the beholder. This is one of the first CRT billboards, the first interactive advertisement. It's probably the start of a whole new form of advertising. You get a look at the Mercure XR4 Ti sports car, both graphically and in terms of its specifications. Plus, you can compare it to other sports cars in its class. One clever feature allows you to print your own window sticker based on the optional equipment you want, which may also bring on sticker shock when 19,924 pops up as the bottom line, excluding taxes, title, license, and destination charges. It may seem like just another form of hype to you, but when we got our disc, it came late with a small notice apologizing for the delay because demand far exceeded supply. Now, whether floppy ads are less irksome than others remains to be seen, but at least you have a free floppy to use when you're done. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. If you want to buy into a mutual fund to get on board Wall Street's climb but don't know which fund to buy, Business Week magazine has just come out with a program called the Mutual Fund Scoreboard Disquette. It ranks 550 mutual funds and lets you select a fund based on your own personal investment criteria. The disk's files can be imported to Lotus 123 or saved as an ASCII file. The mutual fund disk is selling for $49.95. And if you carry a portable computer with you on your business trips, there's a new piece of software you may want to carry around. It's called Appetite for Business, and it's a database of good restaurants in all major American cities. It includes the usual details. It will also be available as an online service starting in June. A phone company in Boston is copying the CB simulator idea and has created a kind of online telephone pub. For 10 cents a minute, you can chat with folks in a multi-party online conversation. There's a sysop who can zap bad taste folks, and you can lurk on several phone conversations before deciding which one to join. Finally, a Chicago lawyer is suggesting the creation of an online law practice. He says in many instances, legal advice and services can be offered without face-to-face -face contact, and that legal services online could be a lot cheaper and more convenient than an office visit. So it looks like you can now meet online, get married online, and even get divorced online. Isn't progress wonderful? That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible modems. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Leading Edge, leading the way to the information age. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.